We are live, or at least, yeah, here we go. So we are live. Um, it's me, Kevin, like uh, usual. And I've got a special guest, Jackie, uh, Jackie Johnston of Believe in Your Dog. Um, and Jackie's here to talk to us about separation anxiety. Um, this is something that oftentimes people have questions about, and they'll even ask during some of the normal lives, and I just don't have any formal training in it. Uh, neither does Kelly. So we always defer to the experts. Jackie is an expert uh, at that. And so Jackie, you are a graduate of the Academy for Dog Trainers. And yes. you are also, you've got your CSAT shirt on, Certified Separation Anxiety Trainer. So pretty cool stuff. You have a ton of education, which means that you know what you're talking about. At least I think so. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> so welcome. Um, Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. And I know that um, I talk a lot. You're going to get to talk most of this time, I think, which is pretty cool. I'll shut up. So I've got some questions I want to ask you, kind of, you know, typical interview type thing. And then I want to leave time at the end for anybody to have questions. Um, Jackie, I know that you want to start off by kind of giving some feedback in regards to how you might answer questions. So uh, do you want to kind of mention that now? Yeah. So um you know, I, I just want to make sure that because every every dog in every situation is really individual and so uh, can be so nuanced and because we're dealing with something that can can be complex, I, I, I can't really answer questions specifically about individual dogs or their individual situations. Um, I can answer kind of general questions. So if I get a question that it feels like um, I'm just not able to ethically answer or give quick tips because this is this isn't one of those quick tips sort of um, situations with separation anxiety um, I, I'll just recommend that that person reach out to a certified uh, separation anxiety trainer for guidance I just want to make sure that people are really um, set up for success as much as possible so well and don't and if I'm not mistaken <clears throat> you or at least some of the trainers that have your same certification um, do some sort of a initial consult to make sure it's even a good fit, right? Yeah, so um, we typically work in packages uh, whenever we do start the actual training protocol. Um, but there is the option and which comes along with the package as well of doing an initial assessment, which is a 60 to 90 minute uh, consultation one-on-one okay. -on -one online, um, where we can help you just sort of determine um, is your dog struggling when they're left home alone if you don't know? Um, and then talk to you about you know what what this is and what it entails to uh, help your dog recover and things like that. So that is an option for sure for people. Cool. Okay. Well, and I, I, you know, if it's not, you know, you'll talk more about it when we get to that. I'll I'm jumping ahead a little bit. So I get let's kind of dive in and and talk about like I, I know from experience that when people fill out private training forms, sometimes they will mark off separation anxiety. And so we'll ask like, from our perspective, like all dogs go to Kevin, we'll ask some questions to see if it really is like separation anxiety. So why don't we start off by talking about, you know, what is separation anxiety? What, how would you define it if you could, or. Yeah. So, um, I see that a lot too. And, um, especially when I worked in the shelter for a couple of years where, um, relinquishment forms would automatically tick that box. And um, and a lot of times it's hard to really discern. I think that a lot of people um, imagine that their dog might be uncomfortable and left alone if there's a variety of different things happening. So um, we often use separation anxiety as an umbrella term to encompass um, a variety of behaviors that indicate that a dog is uncomfortable or anxious when left alone. Um, and so most commonly what we're really dealing with is um, isolation distress so there's kind of some confusing terminology um, and that's why we use that umbrella term, but isolation distress would be um, a dog who is uh, uncomfortable when left all alone, right? And um, separation anxiety actually is a clinical diagnosis where a dog is attached to one key person. So if mom and dad are home and um, dog is attached to mom and mom leaves, but dad is still home, that dog might still be uncomfortable. Right, so um, it's a little less common than the other type of um, where it, just any warm body will do, right? Um, and, and that's that's a little bit easier to work through and to manage. They're, they're both doable, but that one's a little bit easier. Um, and so a lot of times people are talking about one of those behaviors or um, confinement anxiety. So a dog is trying to break out of a kennel or distress when they're locked inside of a kennel when the owner leaves. Um, and then sometimes you have the dogs who are 
uh, having a party. So um, having a good time while the parents are gone and then the parents come home and there's trash everywhere and the um, remote is chewed and they presume um, not knowing, right? That this dog is distressed when they're gone. And so um, there's a variety of things that could be happening when a dog is left home alone. And I think it's really important before we say, okay, let's do this um, intensive five days a week training for a dog who's maybe barking at um, squirrels out the window, right? So <laughs> yeah. we want to just make sure we get eyes on that and really determine what's happening for that dog when they're left alone so that we uh, can uh, prescribe the appropriate uh, training protocol. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, um, lack of education on my part here, I did not realize that um, there's like a difference between how, how we're labeling separation anxiety. And I, and I believe you said isolation distress, I think is how you worded it. Uh, I did not, I didn't know that. Um, so that's really cool to know yeah. because I would have assumed that, and that what happens when you assume, but I would have assumed that, you know, it's basically if there's a person there, they're good. If there yeah. is no person there, then it's bad news. So that's, that's fascinating. I like to, to know that. Um, that's, yeah. That's yeah. It's cool. I think it's, it's also really important to think about this in terms of, you know, what's the, what's the behavior that we're seeing when the guardian is gone or when separated from one person and what's the uh, even more so important is what's what's the body language look like right which is behavior so how does this dog look when they're um destroying something you know are they panting pacing drooling vocalizing or is there you know happy play face and you know wiggly body while they're partying in the trash so i think that's an important distinction too I like, I like the opportunists that oftentimes get mistaken for, <laughs> for having extreme anxieties or whatever. It's, it, they're just like, oh, well, I figured out that it's green light when my person's gone. So here we go. Um, yeah. It's so, a relief when people hear that for sure. <laughs> um, I found that I always feel like, and this isn't, uh, I feel like it, and it's tricky though. Like when you have a dog that's really young and has the uh, I don't want to say ability because they all have ability to, but that would be more prone to doing something like that because they're younger and more active. Um, uh, anyway, so basically like if we're, you know, a lot of times people go with confinement training for dogs that are going <clears> to <throat> potentially do that to keep them out of trouble. But then if we, and we'll kind of talk about this later, but if we get into separation anxiety or isolation distress or, or actual crate issues, then you can't really confine them or right. not to tiny places. So I feel like that is a tricky balance and I know that's yeah. probably something that you deal with, but yeah, it's a major tricky balance for sure. And, and, and one thing that we sometimes see, which is kind of nice, but still we have to figure it out is that when dogs do recover, um, sometimes they start partying, you know, like, so sometimes <laughs> they'll start like, Oh, I'm comfortable enough to now surf the counter and get into the trash. And I've had some find the treat bag up on the table and, party on that and a uh, variety of things. So it's a little like, phew, you know, you're yeah. a normal dog. And <laughs> I call that a win. I mean, I know that people find that frustrating, yeah. like yeah. You know, personally, like I have a, a lock on my garbage can because V who is nice. 14 and, and four or five months will gladly get into the garbage when home alone. Um, you know, so anyway, management for the win. Right. But so let's kind of dive into my next question, which is I, I heard a percentage at one point. I couldn't, I didn't put much research into it, but it was like an incredible amount of dogs suffer from, I'm going to use the term separation anxiety. I'm going to gladly have you correct me with that in terms of whether it's truly the separation anxiety or isolation totally or whatever. Fine. But, yeah. We just, but, again, we use it as an easy to understand. Yeah. Separation nice. anxiety works. I like easy. So let's, you know, <laughs> why, why do so many dogs suffer from it? Um, do you have any idea? So I think that's a really good question. Um, and I, I want to give a shout out actually to uh, Melena's, uh, Melena Martini's new book is out. Um, you can get it on Dogwise or Amazon. And um, she kind of points out in the beginning, and I, I think this is a really a good, a good way to think about it in that um, dogs are really social animals. And if you think about this from a, us behavior nerds, you know, we like to think of things from an evolutionary standpoint, um, that it's adaptive for animals to um, use their behavior to keep their family closer to let their family know where they are or if they're lost or in distress. Um, and we know that, um, you know, it's, that works for them out there, right? And I don't know that they're designed to be in a house isolated and alone all day, right? And, and I'm not saying that causes it. But we do know that 
that um, causes separation anxiety is oftentimes big life transitions. Um, I see a lot of that. So I see a lot of like, uh, one of the dogs in the family passed away or someone moved out or someone moved in or um, they moved across the country or moved into a new home. Um, so any sort of transition, I see that a lot. Um, and then uh, I've had quite a few clients too where there was some sort of traumatic event. Most recently, um, there was a, a big altercation at doggy daycare. One of the dogs was, was really severely injured and um, from there developed um, distress when left alone. So, um, you know, any sort of big transition like that and there is some, some research out there that shows that there's a genetic component. So some dogs do just have that genetic predisposition. Wow. That, I did not know that either. So, and, and, and I, a lot of those things are kind of, again, I, 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 it's all new to me. So to yeah. think that having somebody move into the home would potentially cause that, that's pretty fascinating. And I would say, so then like, if it's somebody that maybe you really didn't even want to move in your home anyway, the easiest way to solve it would be get them out of there, right? Get, get the person out, kick them out. And that would go back. Yeah. And, that, and that's <laughs> not to say, right. Like that, that will set things back to normal. You know, um, I think the interesting thing about all of these components is that they're all sort of things that are out of our control, which kind of leads into your next question, which I'll let you go ahead we, if you're ready. No, we didn't plan these questions out. These were just off, <laughs> off the top of my head. Well, it, well then, yeah, my next Sorry. question. No, no. But my next question is, do people do things to like cause this? Because a lot of times, you know, I will have well, you know, whether it be separation anxiety related or something else, like, well, I know I'm the problem. I'm the one that caused it. And I'm thinking, well, maybe not, not really for other things, but for something like this, do people cause it? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I, and I um, again, want to go back to the, the reasons we talked about that, that dogs can develop it and talk about that all of those reasons are out of our control, right? Um, and then I, I want to 100% absolve anyone who's listening of any feeling that they may have done anything to cause this if your dog is experiencing it. I get so many clients who um, blame themselves and talk about the things they do that they've read um, could have caused this like um, sleeping and letting their dog sleep in the bed or letting their dog sleep, sleep on the couch like mine's doing right now. Um, spoiling your dog, right? Like. Um, there's no indication, and there's even some research on this as well, that, that anything that the guardian's doing and any way that they're interacting with the dog is going to cause separation anxiety. Um, so I uh, encourage people to please um, spoil your dogs. I think that they're not with us long enough. So um, give your dog lots of love and lots of snacks and, um, and you know, don't worry about that, right? Like, Dogs learning is so, um, we know this as trainers, right? It's so contextual. They're so like, um, because my dog's sleeping on the couch, how in, how in any way does that indicate that he's gonna be distressed when left alone? They're just two totally separate pieces, right? I thought it was because he was alpha and then he didn't let you right. leave. I heard right. that once. <laughs> right, yep. <laughs> or, you know, let him go through the door first is gonna make them you know, start paying your taxes and taking the kids to school. I don't know. Um, but I do want to say that, like, when you start training, um, there are definitely things that you want to avoid that could hinder your training progress. And, and this is a separate from you causing separation anxiety, right? Um, and I think that that's where it's really helpful to work with an expert who can guide you through this process, because there are some things you want to do right, and you don't want to do, you want to set your dog up for success, right? Well, what we'll do is we'll plug your information again at the end. And then I know that like the, I know there's only so many clients you can see at a time. So the, the, the website listed with other ones too, if, if we want to list that we can. So, um, but so I think that's nice to know that people can know that they're not necessarily the cause of it. So many people, like you said, feel so guilty. Like, I know it's my fault. I, you know, gave him that ice cream cone when I left the one time and, um, and you know, yeah. so. Yeah. Uh, and know. I've had, uh, we know that there are trainers out there, um, unfortunately who, who tell people that they're causing it. Well, that's you the know? easiest thing to do, isn't it? Just blame, totally, right, blame the person. Right. We do have a couple of questions that I'll kind of go through at the end. So if anybody that y'all that have uh, asked these questions, we'll kind of 
come back um, to it. So um, cool. So we've got a few more questions for you. Uh, by we, I mean, I am the only one here to ask you questions. Um, so COVID, uh, hmm. uh, I would assume that maybe it would be helpful. COVID has been helpful for some dogs that are suffering, yeah. but I, I don't know. But then I would, I've heard from others that I think like we had a question, uh, in the, originally, like in the, in the, in the original post, like I'm worried about what's going to happen because of COVID. So what have you seen with COVID? How has it affected dogs with separation anxiety compared to what may it cause with dogs that didn't have it before or weren't sure? Yeah. So, yeah. So like we talked about big life transitions, which is what we're in the middle of right now. Right. Um, so you touched on this, that there's, uh, there's pros and cons with COVID. I mean, I think just like, even if you don't have a dog, right, there's some things that suck about it. And there's some things that we're, we're, um, experiencing that might be um, positives, right? Um, so my colleagues and I have absolutely seen an uptick in people reaching out for help. It's, it's really hard to say definitively what has caused this. Um, I think it's a variety of things. Um, again, like major, major uh, disruption and transition in people's lives, uh, that includes our dog's lives, right? Um, and I've personally, what I've experienced recently is a lot of dogs who were adopted after lockdown, um, who may not have just naturally been left home alone for weeks. And when they finally were, um, the guardian noticed some manifestation of anxiety um, while they were absent. Um, I think also that people are talking about it a lot. Um, trainers are now, everyone wants to do it, which is awesome. Um, you can do it from home. Um, but I, I think that there's a lot of information circulating about separation anxiety right now. And so people are more aware. Um, and, and, and again, like a big change, you know, I know I was personally, I would not have been if I never knew anything about separation anxiety. I was personally concerned about my own dog um, who does not have a history of separation anxiety. And I, uh, because I suddenly didn't leave my house for weeks and I'm already mm -hmm. like an introvert and don't leave my house much, but now I really don't leave my house. And, um, and then I moved across country. Um, so I was really careful when I first left him alone, maybe more conservative than anyone else has been and just really like watched him monitored on camera. And I even like, I, I called Milena and I was like, should I be worried? Because everybody's talking about you should be worried about your dog for COVID. And, and, uh, and I was like, Oh, my gosh, I haven't left him alone in four weeks. I haven't even like, if I go on a walk, he goes with me. If I go check the mail, my partner's inside. Um, and she was like, you know, calm, calm down and, and do your normal stuff, right? Like do your, and I was doing my normal stuff, but I was never not taking him with me. Right. So I, so I just gradually started like, I'm going to go check the mail and I'm going to go for a walk without you, which was weird. Um, so I, I definitely rec go ahead. walking without a dog. I, I know like, it was strange. Like, what do I do with my hands? Like, <laughs> what do I look at? I'm not looking for dogs. Well, this is strange. <laughs> right. Yeah, totally. Um, so, so I think it's worth, it's a, it's also a pro, right? Because I have a lot of clients right now who I was working with before COVID and they were pretty stressed pre-COVID because they couldn't leave their dog home alone except for the training, right? And, um, and now I still check in with them about how they're feeling about um, suspending absences. And, um, and it's so much easier for people right now, I think, in general, most, most people, right? There's, they're not like needing to get out of the house. They're not, there's not that pressure. So I think it's a really good time to work on it, which I think people are recognizing too. I mean, yeah. So many people are like, well, maybe I'll leave. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll just stay in, you know? Uh, so that, that's, that's cool. I mean, I hope that people can then take advantage of it if they are working from home, from home on how to make this happen. Um, because I feel bad. I think everyone feels bad for a dog that is dealing with such stress and anxiety that it's, you know, like causing self harm or, you know, just right. puddles of drool that are, you know, the size of it. like, whoa, is that drool or what is that? That is so right, much liquid. Right. How did that come out of you? So yeah. really, so, and what, uh, again, it goes back to our people causing it. It's nice to know that, you know, you're not necessarily going to cause it. Maybe a life change can, can have an effect, like you said, but 
it, it's it's kind of nice though that people aren't necessarily you know causing it yeah too. for sure i even with with covid i get some clients who haven't left the dog alone except that one time when they figured out the dog was distressed when they left them alone and they feel bad about that and they're like i haven't it's because i haven't left them alone and i'm like no i'm glad you haven't you know right like if this dog was distressed and you were leaving them you know however many times a day uh, however many days a week that can make it a little harder um, when we get started right so so less is better. When I hear that, I'm, I'm like, yay, I'm glad you haven't been right. Like at a level where the dog's uncomfortable. Okay. You know, I think maybe people think that, um, oh, you just got to leave them enough and they'll get over it. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, just let them cry it out or whatever. Right. Um, I, I think it's unlikely that that would work. Um, but right. I mean, yes. so, um, what's next here? So, uh, some of these quite uh, the next question I have kind of relates to you. Like you, I, I was, oh, thank you, V. I was, um, bless you. So I, I was reviewing your stuff and I know cause you and Kelly talk a lot, like you are solely doing separation anxiety now. So like what got you into it and, and yeah, let's start off with that. What got you into it? Um, what got me into it, I had no idea I would be interested in it until I heard, um, Malena speak at, uh, the shelter that I worked at. Um, so we would intermittently have guests uh, come do workshops and things. And, and Milena Martini and Casey McGee came and did a uh, talk on separation anxiety and a whole day on shelter dogs and separation anxiety. And I mean, just the, um, what really got me interested was the, the amount of passion that she had. Um, the piece that really fascinated me um, as, as uh, someone who's interested in behavior was the straight des desensitization piece. So uh. um, as positive trainers, we all uh, typically train with food, right? Um, and I love food and let's train with food. I think it's fantastic. And with separation anxiety, it's a little special in that we don't use food. Um, and so we're just gradually exposing the dog to absences at a level where they're totally comfortable and then um, gradually increasing that duration. Um, so I was really interested in that, like, because okay. we sometimes as, as doing other things, we do desensitization and counter conditioning, which is the food piece. Um, but you never really think about using desensitization just all just... by itself. So I thought that was really cool. Um, the way that she spoke about the types of clients that you get when you're, um, going on this endeavor, um, the most just, and this has been my experience, just the most committed um, compassionate, empathetic, will do whatever it takes uh, type clients. I've really found that to be true. Um, it's very reinforcing for you as a trainer too, because, you know, we always do our best to obviously help the dog and the person and to have people that are so dedicated. That means, you know, the effort right. you're putting in is just met with exactly what is needed. So that's really You cool. need, yeah, you need it. Yeah. That's yeah. Really and, cool. and, and I really love the reason I shifted to, it, it's really interesting because when I first graduated Melinda's program, my first two clients, um, actually when I worked with Melinda were, were probably the wonderful clients, but the, uh, probably the most challenging cases that I've had. Oh, um, <laughs> and, and I had no, experience well, I had the experience of the course but I had no you get that kind of reinforcement and that confidence as you go along and each dog that graduates you're like oh yes oh yes right this works I can do this and um, I think for me I was just like whoa <laughs> is this normal um, you know and, and and so there was a time where I was like I can't I can't do this there's no way I can do this and I just I just kept getting clients and and then I started graduating clients and then I was like uh, seeing it work and, and, and that's so, that just feels so good. Right. And, and, um, and I love so cool. one of the reasons I shifted was that I love the laser focus on one specific problem, right? Like when I was doing other types of training and, and then some trainers love this, I, I, I didn't, um, there were a variety of issues that would come up and it, I sort of felt like it was like triage and it was like, okay, what can we, 
you know, what can I help you with right now? And what can we put on the back burner? And, and now from the get-go, it's just, this is what we're working on. If there are other things that you want and have the bandwidth to work on, um, here's a referral. Uh, so I really like having that. I'm just, just focused on this one issue and resolving it. And you get to work mostly during the day, right? Yeah. That's a nice thing. <laughs> I got home at nine o'clock last night or nine fifteen. Oh. It's all right. You know, I like classes, helping people huh? still. Yeah, yeah, classes. I miss classes. Classes are fun. They are. It's just, uh, I feel bad, you know, because the time slots, like I feel bad that people have to sign up for an eight o'clock time slot, which yeah. I mean, it, in the summer, it's not so bad, but you know, it's already getting dark by seven thirty, yeah. so it gets late, but well, okay. So uh, I'm, 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 I love like everything you said, like you get to just focus on one thing. And I love also that you're getting to see the dogs like graduate. Like you mentioned, I know that when you're working with other things, like as a trainer, sometimes you don't get to see the final product because you're, you're giving them steps, you're helping them through those steps. And then you're like, okay, here are the next two steps. Right. Uh, and they're like, okay, I got this. And then you never necessarily get to see the, the grand finale there. So right. that's really cool. I love hearing that. Um, well, and then I know this is not necessarily, I'm sure this answer to the next, next question could be a long one. Um, fortunately I prepared you ahead of time. So like, how do you, <laughs> how do you help with separation anxiety? I know you kind of touched on it a little bit. Um, but let's, let's kind of formally ask yeah. it, like, what's the process? Yeah. So I, um, start with the most crucial piece, uh, which is, you know, we often refer to in trainer world as management, which means stopping the problem from occurring, um, which in separation anxiety we do by suspending absences. Um, and so if you want to help your dog learn that you being gone from the home is safe and that they are safe when you're gone, um, we can't throw them in the deep end every now and then, right? So. Um, Number one, they're not going to learn that absences are safe. Um, and number two, it's just very, very likely impossible that we're going to make it worse, right? Okay. So, um, so that's the key. And this can sound really daunting, I think, to people when I first mention it. Um, but it's doable and it's being done all the time. Um, so our job as separation anxiety trainers is to um, really help people brainstorm and figure out how to make this happen for their lives. And even with clients, I have some clients who are like retired and they are like, we never leave the house anyway. And this is sort of how I am. I, if I were training with a trainer, I'd say that, oh, I never leave home anyway. But I think it's so important to really prepare people for, um, you'll want to, right? And, and you should. Um, and so let's figure that out together. How can we have a plan? Um, whether that's, you know, sitters or daycare or your neighbor, or there's just so many ways. And I think that sometimes people hear that and they're like, no way I can do that. There's mm -hmm. absolutely no way I can do that. Um, and if you give us some time to, uh, help you find ways to do that, we can find ways to do that for sure. Um, so that's the first piece. Um, and you know, I think that in an ideal world, this is a village effort. So in my perfect setup um, from the get-go, my client's village includes uh, me, uh, their veterinarian and or their veterinary behaviorist, um, care for the dog when they need to get out of the house, a support system. Like um, this can be really challenging to just do by yourself. Um, and so I think that's really important to have that village and and let your trainer help you establish that village as well. Um, so from there, we uh, start a gradual desensitization protocol. So what we're doing is that we are gradually exposing the dog to absences at a level where they are showing no anxiety behaviors, right? Okay. Um, so what we have to do is really systematically break down an absence into its tiniest pieces, right? Um, so if you imagine a real absence, which is a full blown, like, um, I'm looking for my keys and I'm, um, getting my shoes and I'm getting my purse and I'm getting all my stuff. Th this starts that your dog notices all of that. Right. And dogs who are distressed when left alone 
are noticing that like even my dog who's not distressed he's like where are we going what are you doing <laughs> i was like oh the key is my going with you so <laughs> they notice all these things right and for a dog who's distressed when left alone often that's the so that's the start right like they're like oh beep almost cussed <laughs> here it I comes don't do that. <laughs> you have a beeper. <laughs> no. Beep. Um, so you can't start there, right? Uh -huh. Like you can't start with like, okay, let's start. You're going to get your shoes, get your keys, get your purse, like exit, come right back. But like, you've already started for most dogs that anxiety cycle, right? Um, so if you think about how can we break that down into the tiniest pieces possible. So depending on the dog, typically I might start with um, none of those cues, right? So none of those pre-departure cues at all. So we're just going to start walking to the door and you're going to walk to the door and you're going to jiggle the doorknob. Okay. <laughs> and they're like, are you serious? <laughs> and then we call it performance art for, for your dog. And <laughs> well, that's a very doable um, step for a person. You just got to get oh, up yeah. however many times, 15, right. whatever you, whatever you're yeah, telling them to do, yeah. you know, and jiggle a doorknob. I mean, that's, that's, they get not... in, they get in their steps, yeah. right? Like, yeah, that's a good thing. Um, and so we, you're hopefully working with someone who is, or you're really got your body language literacy down and you, you know what you're seeing. Um, Cause if you're walking to the door and your dog's like panting already or vocalizing, which some do, then, you know, instead of saying, oh, this doesn't work, I'm gonna stop. You know, I tried desensitization, it doesn't work how can you break that down even smaller, right? So you're gonna orient to the door and take a step towards the door, maybe depending on the dog, right? Yeah. So every dog's an individual. We start at the level where they um, are comfortable and we proceed from there. And so, um, yeah, it's just about taking it and breaking it into these digestible pieces for your dog. What, and I, I, I know the answer, at least I think I do, but like, why can't we use food? Like why, what's wrong with food in this scenario? Yeah, good question. Um, so different things, um, food. So typically if you're, if you think about people, right? Like if you're distressed, everybody's different. So some people can't eat at all when they're distressed. Um, Me, some people, <laughs> Melena pointed that pointed out somewhere. I can't remember where, but like you can be crying and eating and like scooping your ice cream into your mouth, right? Like you, it, it's not really an indication of comfort. So uh -huh. um, I think that it's often used as a, as a Band-Aid or a distraction. So what I've seen a lot is sometimes people will send me a video of their dog for an absence. And what they're doing is they're putting a Kong down and then leaving and either the dog's too stressed to eat that Kong or the dog's stressed and they're eating the Kong anyway, and they're uh -huh. sort of like frantically eating it and and then it's gone and they're like, oh, now I'm alone, right? So, so one thing with food is that it doesn't really give us an organic read on how the dog's doing. Okay. Um, and I think it's really important to gauge that based on that, the behaviors they're exhibiting in the body language, right? If you're eating your Kong, I, I can't tell if you're uncomfortable. Um, and then there's the rare case where I don't want to freak anybody out. <laughs> I think I know what you're going to say. Yeah, you could put the food down and then leave. And then your dog learns that predictive relationship that food predicts absences. Food is scary, right? And that's not common, but it, yeah. it could happen in theory, right? Well, but to play, to, to, to not freak anybody out. I mean, that that's for dogs that are potentially going to be the type of dogs that are going to have the separation anxiety for like the average yeah. dog that shows no signs right. getting that Kong isn't going to all of a sudden create separation anxiety. Totally. So. And, and using food, food runs out, right? Like, and you typically, when people, people's goals are typically like two to four to six hours, I want to be able to leave. And mm -hmm. um, there's no food that's going to last that long. Right. What if there was though? That would be amazing. I know. I would eat it. No, I'm just kidding. They, yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking of all the possibilities, all the downfalls of your dog eating for six hours, right? Well, it's like an IV drip of like a flavored water that, that drips. You might drips be onto something. 
Well, we used to use lickety, lickety sticks, not for anything separation anxiety related, but you know, like lickety sticks, I use, they, don't, they don't make them anymore. Maybe another company does, but it was a fantastic treat that was a liquid yeah. that oftentimes they could even eat when they're getting like medical things done because they're not actually consuming much. It's a liquid. And uh, anyway, I get on little cool. tangents. <laughs> So, I, so, I, I, so basically, I, go ahead, simple, go ahead. simple, but not easy. I think that's a really important. It sounds simple to say, we're going to take an absence and break it into baby steps. And we're going to gradually expose you to absence at a level where you are totally fine. Um, I think that sounds straightforward, right? Um, it's, it's not typically straightforward. I, I can um, imagine. So, yeah, so I don't want to give the impression that it's easy. It's doable, it's fixable, um, but it's not always easy. Um, there's a lot that goes into this. And one piece I think that's so important that I see clients who have tried desensitization and, and struggled is either going too fast um, or not tracking data. And it's such an important thing that the CSATs do so beautifully is that um, piece of like, when you're training, what time of day is it? When you're training, who's doing the leaving? Is it mom, is it dad, is it mom and dad together? Um, what did your dog eat that day? Did they have any meds that day? And at what time, um, how much exercise did they have? So these things all sort of come together to create a picture or a pattern sometimes of, um, okay, so maybe evenings at six o'clock are really difficult for this dog and we need to back off on our plan a little bit during that time. Um, and I think that's something that your average guardian might not notice or track. So I think that if you are doing this on your own, that's so important to be tracking that stuff. Well, that's what I was thinking. It's like, well, you could give a blanket statement to somebody and say, well, start off with putting your shoes on. Right. But if that completely sets the dog off into like a complete panic, I mean, I assume it would work, but it would take like weeks and weeks and weeks possibly, or maybe it wouldn't work at all because it is too maybe. extreme. Yeah. I mean, it's so that to give like a blanket statement of start with <laughs> shoes. Yep. Obviously from what you're saying, sounds like that would be very unfair to, and, and, and you also said, I, I forget how you worded it, but basically, and I know this is true along other lines too. If we just give like a little piece of advice, maybe it was what you said right out of the gate, but if you give a little piece of advice, a person might try it. And then, yep. well, this doesn't work. Hey, she said to me. do this and it didn't yeah. work. <laughs> it's like yeah. oh, dealing with uh, a dog that's dealing with some aggression. Okay. Just have, you know, the, the person come in and then just have the Talk person give the dog some, yeah. And yeah. that'll solve it. Um, right. and, and so it's, that's, that's what we have to be careful of. So, um, yeah. so uh, that's about all I have to ask. I, I've got, we've got a couple of questions here. Um, uh, Glenna asked, does separation anxiety tend to have any, uh, I don't know how to say that word, but I looked it up to so like comorbid. I can't say it. Um, uh, comorbidity. comorbidity. Yeah. That's, that that's, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be embarrassed by my lack of knowledge yeah. of that word, but I went ahead and just butchered it. So what do you think? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So one big question I always ask, um, every single client is, is your dog sensitive to sound? Um, so uh, there's some research, I can't remember the exact number, but it's high, it's above 50% that dogs who have separation anxiety um, or separation related problems also have uh, sound sensitivities. So, um, which we know also from recent research that sometimes dogs with sound sensitivities could be having pain that we don't know about, right? So um, those that having that village of the vet and or vet behaviorist is so important to make sure that we're addressing those issues. So um, always ask about sound sensitivity with a separation anxiety dog and vice versa, for sure. That's interesting. I know, I, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. Uh, I'm not just uh, like, I mean, this is so much fun to to learn all this stuff from you. And I, I think everyone else is really enjoying it too. Um, we've got a lot of people that have been watching really pretty much the whole time. Um, you should so, be a separation anxiety trainer. You should all, everyone should do it. Everybody should do it. Now I would, I would like to, I'm finishing up my Academy stuff still. So I'm almost done with that, but uh, then maybe I'll dive in. So yeah. um, I do have, well, let's kind of go through. Um, so, and then I'm just going to stick with Glenna real quick. She says, do most of your, ben uh, most of your cases benefit from an anti-anxiety medication? Uh, I have a big pro meds bias. So um, <laughs> The answer is yes. Um, I think that's a conversation to have with your veterinarian for sure. 
or veterinary behaviorist. And I really try not to expose my bias, but apparently I just did right off the bat. Yeah, um, you, did. You, you just did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have some really great, if anyone wanted to email me or contact me on my website, I, I have a handout that I created with resources about behavioral medication. It's not, it's not a handout saying you should ask your vet for these certain meds because we don't do that. Right. Um, it is articles, uh, and webinars and information from vets, um, about medication. And so that the client can read through that information, be informed and make an informed decision with their veterinarian. Um, my personal experience has been, um, most dogs who are doing the behavior modification in combination with behavioral pharmaceuticals are progressing more quickly and more consistently than dogs who aren't. Do you find, and I'm a follow-up question, this is my question, but do you find for separation anxiety, is it any different than, well, I know that you're not necessarily working the other cases anymore, but I'm, I know you did before. Is it, do people, when you mention that, do people put up like me, I don't want to do that. Or people do you feel like they're more likely to, to jump on with that since it's, they're seeing so much stress. Yeah, it really depends on the person and whatever their own biases and experience is. I, I personally, when I, I had hired a trainer for my own dog, which got me interested in training originally. And she suggested meds. She suggested speaking with my vet about meds for him. And I was like, Oh my God, I could never do that. Right. I don't want him to be a different dog. I don't want him to be a zombie. Um, and she had to walk me through that. And so did my vet. And, uh, I can't believe I come from that place, but I, I have that experience, you know, and now I'm just like, um, I gotta be careful. I really gotta yeah. be careful with the way I talk about this. Um, but well, I think that, I, I think that people are in a position with separation anxiety where they're looking definitely for resolution rather than sometimes with other problems, we might, we might manage the environment to the extent where the behavior doesn't occur as often and everybody's got some relief. Um, typically people who have a dog with separation anxiety are looking for resolution sure. from the get, we sign on, we are like, we want to get to our goal. Right. And so there are the, there are different types of people. There are the people who are like already, already on meds, already talked to the vet. And mm -hmm. there are the ones who are, let's try it for a little while and see how it goes. Um, and then once we've grueled through for a few weeks, they are ready to try, to try that. Um, I, I would say from the get go, I would have a conversation with your vet as to what they would suggest for sure. I like that answer. And it's funny, you said the same thing when I with V who at, he was three or something at the time, he was dealing with some issues with other dogs and the trainers I was working with were like, get him on some meds. And I was like, I don't want to, I, you know, uh, I want to help him through it on his own. And then like, finally, I don't know if they talked me into it or if I just did it on my own, but I got him on some like herbal thing. Um, and I don't remember if it even did anything other than it was ex extremely expensive. And finally I just gave in and got him on some, like whatever the vet recommended it was Prozac and, and it helps. It helped a lot. Yeah. So but it's funny because yeah. I mean, same thing. I came from the same spot here. Um, yeah. Here's a question. Laura asked, uh, I have a 10 week old Labradoodle. Is there a way to prevent separation anxiety? That's a good question. Um, I think that I would say, I don't worry about it until I have a reason to worry about it. I, I don't want everyone worrying about their dog potentially having or getting separation anxiety. So I, I would probably say um, 10 week old. Oh, you got a puppy. Start exposing your dog to absences at a um, short, short absences, short times away from you, especially with a 10 week old puppy. I would start with, um, can you just walk out of the room for five minutes, right? And, and are they comfortable with that? So you kind of have to gauge your own individual dogs um, level of comfort. And then as far as prevention, I would just start easy for, especially for a 10 week old puppy, right? Like they're, they're not accustomed to being left alone. So I, I would absolutely be like, once you're able to move about the house and they're comfortable in their area and a playpen or out in the house, then start saying, okay, I'm going to walk out the front door and I'm going to keep an eye on them and see how they're doing. And um, gradually, you know, just make sure that you're moving through that at a pace where your puppy's okay. You've, what you don't want to do is 
if I leave and my puppy's crying the whole time, and people say this with puppies all the time, let them cry it out. I, I would not do that for sure. Okay. That's a nice way of preventing it is to not do that. Well, and I, I can imagine too that like, let's say Laura, you know, say Laura had a, a dog that had separation anxiety and now she's got a puppy and she's like, oh, I don't, I don't want to, you know, have that happen again. So I think that's a really mm -hmm. good question. Yeah, um, for sure. We got, let's do a couple more questions and uh, I don't want to keep you forever. Um, but let's, um, Bob asks, can a dog with separation anxiety benefit from other dogs in the household without it? Um, so, you know, living with another dog that doesn't have it, um, people, cause Bob says people often ask, should I get another dog? What have you seen there? Yeah, that's a good question too. Um, could help, could end up with two dogs with separation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I've seen some dogs who are comfortable if one dog, if there's another dog in the house. Um, so what I, what I hesitate to say is that if you have a dog who has separation anxiety is to don't add another dog expecting that that's going to fix it. Um, you could end up with no change. Um, you could end up with two dogs experiencing distress when you're gone, whether the other one is prone to it or the, the one you currently have is anxious, which then gets the other dog anxious. Um, or if you're using it as a band-aid, if your dog is comfortable when another dog is home with them, what happens when you have to leave? You know, it's kind of a crutch. Um, so, so there's no good yes or no answer. I, my experience has been that not typically does that yeah. fix it. I think people have asked me that before. And again, I tell people like, Hey, I'm not, that's not my, my line of work, but I said, I, right. I, I think I tell them like, sometimes people get lucky, but, uh, or you could end up with, yeah. you know, double the trouble. Right. Good question, Bob. Um, Glenna, full of good questions here. Are there any breed or gender trends in separation anxiety? I don't think so. That's a good question, Glenna. Um, I think that there's not been any research that I know of on that. You hear it all the time though, just like you hear with any other behavior issue, right? That it's like specific breeds are prone to X, Y, Z, which yes, we know that uh, from an ethologist standpoint that, that specific breeds do have specific tendencies. Um, but I haven't seen anything like that as far as um, these breeds are more likely or these genders are more likely. No. What about German shepherds though? <laughs> They're special. <laughs> I love being a German shepherd. I feel like they always, um, I don't even know, whenever we have them in class, if they're like the last one to get to exit, they're like screaming. They're like, ah, I think it's the <laughs> shepherd in them though. But. Yeah. All right. I've got a couple, um, couple of longer questions that I want to read through. And I think we'll wrap up on that, uh, on that note, but basically Taylor says, all right, month old pup we got during quarantine is only known mm -hmm. having humans at home 24 seven since we're back to work now. She struggles heavily with her crate, biting, barking, and the dreaded pooping. The pooping is occasional, but will happen more often than not for a fully potty trained dog. We've recently tried using crate covers to calm her and had some success um, soaking all the, and Taylor said she's soaking all this info in right now. That was the first time I read it. So basically it yeah. sounds like stressed in the crate and also pooping maybe due to that stress. Mm -hmm. um, did I read that well enough for you to understand? I kind of. Yeah, I'm reading it so. too here. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. Congrats on your pup. I want to see pictures. I want to see pictures of all the pups. Post yeah, pictures I'm sorry in the to comments, hear that. Yeah, post your pictures. Um, yeah, that's really, that's tough. And that might be one of those ones that I would recommend reaching out to a certified separation anxiety trainer, whether it's me or any of the other wonderful ones, um, just to get some eyes on what's happening here. Uh, and so we can give you the information that you really need to um, pro progress. Um, when you've got the uh, pooping and house training accidents or, or you know elimination happening in an otherwise house trained dog, which it sounds like that's what you, your dog's experiencing, um, then we can definitely say that there's there's some distress happening here. And what I what I would be interested in, and again, like I have to be careful not to give, you know, really here's what I would do. Um, I, I would you be interested. Can. It's fine. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> For you to see, this is a good, this kind of segues into a good topic that I think is important um, to see what your puppy looks like 
outside of the crate if you left them alone. So, so I wonder if you have had eyes on your dog when you are gone outside the crate, which I know we're, again, like Kevin mentioned, we're walking that line of like management for um, chewing or, or any fun destruction versus crating keeps them, you know, from getting into trouble. But if a dog's distressed when left alone, more often than not, um, if they're confined, they're gonna be more distressed. So it's like, I'm having a panic attack. Now I'm having a panic, like I'm having a panic attack in a big open field versus I'm having a panic attack in an elevator, right? Yeah. Um, so, so I would tend to maybe get eyes on your dog outside of the crate and see if that looks any better. And, and otherwise I would definitely reach out to a certified separation anxiety trainer just for at least one consultation and just see what's really going on. That's, that stinks Good though. Yeah. yeah, I mean, to, to have the pooping in the crate, especially if they're fully yeah. house trained. I mean, I think you could correct that's me if tough. I'm wrong, but I think that's a good sign that maybe there's some anxiety going on there because, you know, who, yeah. You know, but anyway, I mean, so thanks for taking the time to answer that. I know that, again, that's tough. And as you mentioned, and as I mentioned early on, it's like, what do you do if you have eight months old, yeah, old dog? How do you confine them so they don't get into trouble? But um, so I guess. Um, you can also try a bigger confinement area. Um, again, like a X pen type, um, larger room to move around and see how that, if you're worried about dog getting into stuff, um, dog proof an area and use a bigger confinement area and, and watch when you're gone and, and, and don't expose to absences longer than are causing distress, which we can help you with. So reach out. Uh, and I'm going to plug you again before we finish here, but Claire has a question. She's basically saying that she's not sure if it's low-level anxiety, but um, sometimes Raichu, uh, where, where is it? He would go and pick up one or few shoes and move them. There is never any evidence of him trying to chew them. He just picks up a shoe and will either move it all the way up the stairs or last time he moved it like two feet away from where it was sitting. This could be a ghost though. We don't actually, unless there's a video or not. <laughs> No, it is caught on video. Never mind. From the few You're times we caught on video immediately after leaving the house. We otherwise have no issues leaving him alone, except when he first got him, he tried to counter surf. Um, but we got him on camera and stopped. So basically, yeah, the question comes down to yeah. this this shoe moving, and it's not a ghost because not a ghost. it's been caught on film. Uh, so what do you think about yeah, that? I wouldn't worry about that. Um especially if your dog is laying down and sleeping and all they're doing is picking up a shoe and not even chewing, even if they were chewing the shoe and then going to sleep, I wouldn't worry about that. Just pick up the shoes. Mm. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be concerned about that. Maybe it smells like you and your dog likes that and they just want to get a whiff and <laughs> mouthful and then go back to sleep. So yay. Don't worry. Cool. That's awesome. <sighs> All right. Well, that I think is going to go ahead and wrap us up. A lot of people just said this is awesome information. Thanks so much, so much for doing it. So oh, you're so welcome. Um, Amy did say that she's got a, a dog from APL that is dealing with some, and then she had mentioned, you know, is it just a lot of repetition? And I think that you had said, I think you had said, yes, it's a lot of repetition, but we just need to know what step to start off at. And that's basically where consultations come into play. Am I yeah, right? And it's, yeah. It's a lot of repetition, but there's a lot of nuance. Um, you know, there's things like you want to avoid creating patterns. Dogs are really good at noticing patterns. So if I tell you, just like Kevin was saying, if I say, yeah, exit your door and wait five minutes and come back, if that's, you know, how long your dog is comfortable, um, uh, that sounds really easy. But let's say, just for example, you only ever do that at 6 p.m., right? Um, because that's when your schedule allows for you to train. Um, you could create a dog if you only ever train at 6 p.m. who's comfortable with absences at 6 p.m. But anytime you try any other time of day, which might be real life, they might fall apart, right? So, so um, there's more nuance to it than just that. And so I want to actually plug um, it's just some resources for people. And if you need additional resources, you can email me. They get, sometimes people can't do the whole shebang, like four week package. And I totally understand that. So I have a nice handout with lots of different resources. Um, but there's an online DIY self-paced course that uh, on Melena's website, melenadmartini.com called Mission Possible. Um, that is just a self-guided uh, course that walks you through the process in, in case you can't 
commit to working with a trainer. It's really wonderful. And, and it addresses all those nuances that are so important because I can't, the nuances can't be all addressed in this one little, you know, one hour live. So definitely um, check that out, please. We can do another hour if you want, if you want to touch. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I actually have a client in 15 minutes. So. Okay, we'll wrap up. So um, Watch your dog sleep, I hope. Hopefully. Okay. So, and then basically <laughs> your website, well, your Facebook page is believe in your dog. So you could search that on Facebook. Your website, I assume is believe in your dog.com or am I wrong with that? Um, believe in your dog.com, believe in your dot dog, both will get you there. Perfect. Awesome. So um, check that out, everybody. If you want any help, um, reach out to Jackie. Um, thank you so much, Jackie, for doing this. And Jackie, if you, you hold on one second, I'm going to end the live video. I'm going to have you hang out for one second. So, okay. Thanks everybody for watching. We'll be back next week and have a good rest of your day. Bye.